Welcome back to Economic Outlook. In our last entry, we looked at what the bank stress test was and what it measured. Today, we'll look at some of the arguments as to why the stress test may not be the best measure of banks' financial health. As bank stock prices soared last week, some investors began to question whether or not the stress test was a proper measure of banks' financial well-being. Some people accused the Obama administration of setting the bar too low so that banks would beat expectations and create undeserved confidence in the financial industry. The Wall Street Journal reported that several large banks actually negotiated with the Federal Reserve during the stress test process. Here's the direct quote. When the Fed last month informed banks of its preliminary stress test findings, executives at corporations including Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo were furious with what they viewed as the Fed's exaggerated capital holes. A senior executive at one bank fumed that the Fed's initial estimate was mind-numbingly large. Bank of America was shocked when it saw its initial figure, which was more than $50 billion, according to a person familiar with the negotiations. At least half of the banks pushed back, according to people with direct knowledge of the process. Some argued the Fed was underestimating the bank's ability to cover anticipated losses with revenue growth and aggressive cost cutting. Others, are, others urged regulators to give them more credit for pending transactions that would thicken their capital cushion. This chart shows the actual gap between the initial Federal Reserve capital deficiency estimates and the final number. As you can see, several of the large banks had their figures reduced by many billion dollars. The stringency of the capital requirements used in the stress test are the main reason why many people feel it's not a viable measure of banks' financial health. The stress test used what's called Tier 1 capital. This is a very broad measure, and as we said in the previous entry, banks have to have at least $6 in Tier 1 capital for every $100 they lend out or use in their business. Initially, the stress test was to use Tangible Common Equity, or TCE, as the measure of a bank's capital holdings. The $4 in tangible common equity required is a subset of the $6 of Tier 1 capital. However, tangible common equity is a much more stable and narrow measure of a bank's capital than the catch-all Tier 1. Common equity is derived from the sale of stock or from the retention of profits. Tier 1 capital is much more general and can include things like goodwill. Essentially, Tangible common equity measures the amount of capital a bank would have if it were forced to liquidate and be sold off piecemeal. Tangible common equity is the base value you would expect to receive for a failed bank. Tier 1 capital is much different. It can include things like goodwill, which aren't actual tangible assets that can be sold. Here's an example. Goodwill is acquired when a company pays more in an acquisition for another company then the target company is worth in book value. If Bank of America buys a bank for $10 billion and the bank only has $8 billion of book value, Bank of America has to place $2 billion in goodwill on its balance sheet. This would be included in Tier 1 capital, but it's completely intangible and isn't worth anything should the bank fail. Therefore, many people, myself included, feel that tangible common equity would have been a better measure of banks' actual capital reserves. Now, the Federal Reserve decided to use Tier 1 capital, the more broad measure, and it reduced banks' liabilities tremendously, as we saw in the previous chart. Tangible common equity would have resulted in over $60 billion more in capital requirements that banks would have had to issue through common stock or through the retention of profits. Other people have argued that the stress test doesn't accurately predict potential economic declines. The stress test assumed that the economy would shrink by 3.3% this year, with a low of 8.9% unemployment and flat growth in 2010. It also calls for home prices to fall by 22%. These were used in the stress test projections. Now, according to the New York Times, the average private sector forecast shows that the economy will shrink by 2% this year, with unemployment bottoming out at 
Housing prices are expected to climb by 14% this year and an additional 4% next year. The conditions used in the stress test aren't dramatically lower than the average private sector forecast. However, I feel they do represent a viable picture for what the economy may do in the next two years. It was important that the stress test not over-exaggerate potential economic declines because this would cause people to have an undue lack of faith in the banking system. Using numbers that are slightly more aggressive than the average private forecast, I feel was the proper tactic for the stress test. This gives people a realistic impression of what may happen and a realistic expectation for what banks may lose if conditions continue to, continue to deteriorate. Like most things in the economy, the stress test isn't perfect. However, it does provide valuable information for investors to use. It does have its faults. I, I feel that using tangible common equity would have been a better measure of financial health than regular tier one capital. However, since the information is transparent, investors are able to make their own decisions about the projections and assumptions in the report. Overall, the market has responded extremely positively to what the stress test revealed. It's up to the individual investor to make decisions about whether or not the market is overreacting. Thank you again for joining me here at Economic Outlook for this examination of the recent bank stress test. I'll be posting a new update next week, probably looking at the Chrysler situation, although I'll be closely monitoring the bank's new capital offerings to meet the capital requirements set forth in the stress test. I would invite everyone to continue to follow Economic Outlook on the web at its new address, www.econoutlook.com. The address has changed from .net to .com. The old address will still work, but it will redirect you to the new .com address. Please update your bookmarks if you have them. Also, you can follow Economic Outlook on Twitter. I'm using Twitter to post thoughts on breaking news as it happens during the week on major financial topics. Now, obviously, the level of analysis and insight won't be there, but it does allow me to post my views very quickly and as things happen. So I would encourage you to check out the Twitter feed and subscribe there. I'll be back next week with a new entry, and I'll see you then. Thank you.